Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. My name is Tyler Gilson. Today we'll be discussing building apps in Kubernetes, the unforgiving sea of containerization and the lifesaver tools. A little bit about me. I've been working with Kubernetes projects since 2019. I love building distributed systems and developing POCs with all the latest and greatest Kubernetes projects and sharing what I learn with the community. I'm a principal software engineer at Spectral Cloud and feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, the agenda for today, briefly, we will touch on inner versus outer loop development and how that relates to the software development lifecycle. We'll then look at a suite of tools that I hope will be able to help you uh, experience greater efficiency in your personal workflow. And then we'll look at a demo application, uh, Dad Jokes Generator, which showcases some of the tools that I will be discussing. Moving on. Most of us are already familiar with software development lifecycle, and, and perhaps you've heard of the inner versus outer loop development. But just to set the stage for some of the tools I'll be presenting today, I'd like to touch on this a little bit. Essentially, there's been a movement over the past decade or so to shift left, so to speak, in our development workflow, meaning that we take a lot of the practices that are typically invoked in the so-called outer loop as we get nearer to production, and we integrate and execute on those, those tasks earlier in the development lifecycle. And this is desirable because it effectively allows us to capture security issues and perform end-to-end -end and a variety of, of tests early on to catch bugs and ensure high quality. But the downside is that it imposes an increasing, ever increasing cognitive load on us as developers. However, this can be mitigated with the, the understanding and, and usage of certain tools in the ecosystem that, that make this easier. Um, because the goal of you know, achieving parity between the inner and outer loop is, is valuable. It's just how do we do that without making our lives overly complex. So I'll touch on that further today. Okay, let's look at some tools. So typically we start off coding when we're producing software. And where do we do that? We do that uh, on our laptops in our local development environment. Uh, however, um, you know, our laptops sometimes get coffee spilled on them and other things can happen. So if I was to ask you right now, how mad would you be on a scale of one to 10 if your laptop broke? Hopefully the answer would be not close to 10. If it was close to 10, then you should be considering some of the new tools that have been developed recently, such as Gitpod, and there are a suite of others, but essentially they allow for a containerized development environment. And this solves the classic, it works on my machine problem, whereby you know there's some advanced configuration necessary in order to install dependencies and set up test environments so that you can do development against a particular repo. Nowadays, it's simple to containerize all of that complex setup such that new developers can be onboarded instantly and seamlessly, basically make you know like a container, your, your development environment is portable, shippable, and shareable. So definitely something to look into. And another crucial aspect of a development environment, as everyone knows, is secrets and environment variables. And the last thing we want to do is check those sensitive pieces of information into version control. So I'll be touching on a bit uh, tool during the demo uh, known as GitLeaks. GitLeaks is just one of many plugins that can be utilized by the pre-commit tool. Pre-commit will, will invoke the GitLeaks plugin to prevent us from committing sensitive information. This is a, a very useful tool that we should all be aware of. And lastly, when we're writing our code, we should of course keep in mind 12-factor, uh, the concept of a 12-factor app. And this reference here to 12factor.net is something you know every developer should refer back to from time to time, even if we're already familiar. So I encourage you to take a look at that. All right, we've written some of our code. Now we need to build and deploy our code. And how do we do that? Well, you know, in the early days of the container world, we might have done that with uh, Docker Compose. However, nowadays we're, we're mostly in, you know, Kubernetes has sort of eaten the world, so to speak, in the software industry. So I'll be focusing primarily on Kubernetes. Um, we do need to most often leverage tools such as uh, Docker to, to build our container images. And therefore we, we deal with the, a Docker file. And then we wrap all of that in automation, typically using a tried and true tool like Make. You know, it's been around for uh, almost 50 years now. It's, you know, it's battle tested and, 
I encourage the use of Make, but there are some fancy new tools that are worth checking out, uh, notably Taskfile and Earthfile. Earthfile is very interesting because what it does is it allows you to execute all of the typical tasks you, you might consider as Make targets inside of a Docker container. And that allows for ultimate consistency across environments. It'll run exactly the same in your CI pipeline as it will on your local machine and it's architecture independent. So definitely a, a cool uh, so new solution to check out. And then, you know, let's say we've figured out how we are gonna automate the build of our containers. We've written our Docker files and now we need to deploy to Kubernetes. Well, we need manifests for that. And we're typically not deploying just raw manifests, raw YAML. You know, the, the two solutions that most prevalent in industry are, of course, Helm and, and Customize. But I do want to mention that each has their own place. People can often misuse these tools. And in general, I would suggest that anything that is user facing and involves uh, configuration that, that is not internal to your, to your software, that should be done using Helm and, and the templating engine that Helm provides. And then specifically you know, internal environment specific customizations should be applied using customize. And that can be done as a, as a post rendering step where you, you've already, you've rendered your Helm, your Helm chart, and then you customize it further with, with customize. Um, then Q is another incumbent technology that's worth checking out. It, it provides strongly consistent static typing for your manifests and can execute tests against your manifests. Uh, and of course, reducing boilerplate much the same way that, that Helm does, but uh, worth checking out Q as well. All right, so now it comes time to deploy our code. We've built our containers, we have automation in place, and we need to get that running and do some debugging and development, preferably in a local environment. And some popular solutions there are Minikube, Kind, and K3D. However, you know, Developing locally is, is the goal, but it's not always possible because some of the time we can benefit from having access to a more complex development environment that consists of tools and services developed by other teams. And perhaps that, that whole ecosystem is, is complex enough that it's difficult, if not impossible, to stand up locally. In that case, where uh, these other tools that I have listed here below re really shine is that they, they provide a bi-directional file sync that enables us to do in-container development. So what I called a full dev experience. So scaffold, dev space, and tilt enable you to have that complex remote development environment, perhaps running in a Kubernetes cluster hosted by a managed Kubernetes service, and you have your local IDE, and you're performing development against one or more microservices in that cluster, using something like DevSpace, which we'll see in the demo. And what it does is the bi-directional file sync mirrors changes in your local IDE directly into your development container. And you can configure things such as the uh, restart helper to automatically recompile your code when certain files change. You can use Delve for remote debugging and step through breakpoints just like you normally would. So it's a, the full experience of, of your typical development in your local IDE, but it, it's executing remotely. Uh, this, the main problem this solves is the, the classic waiting for the image to build problem, uh, which isn't a problem, it's just tedious. I think uh, these days we're all familiar with the, the boring waiting as we build our image, push it, and then bounce the pod and wait for that to get pulled down, which you know just increases the amount of time it takes to develop software. All right, moving on to security. So we've gotten our whole pipeline in place and we're far from done, however, because throughout that whole process, we need to keep security on our mind. And I'll go through a few tools now that can help in that regard. So for secret management, SOPs and KSOPs are lightweight solutions that one can consider. They enable a Git ops based workflow that allows you to check sensitive information directly into version control. So with SOPs, you can encrypt sensitive manifests, and that can be done by using a key management provider like, uh, you know, AKA or sorry, uh, Amazon Key Management Service uh, or Azure Key Management Service. It also supports PGP, but that's not quite as, as secure. That's more for for development. That's what we'll show in the demo, however. And then KSOPs is just a customized plugin that allows you to invoke SOPs for encryption and decryption directly. Uh, as part of your customization. And 
Then on sort of the other side of the spectrum, we've got Vault, which is a, an enterprise grade solution that can often become necessary. It allows for more flexibility and dynamic substitution of values over and above, you know, having to actually check encrypted manifests into version control. The benefit of Vault as well is that it's of course cloud agnostic. And lastly, Trousseau is worth men mentioning. It uh, uses the Kubernetes um, KMS provider framework. And what's unique about it is that it allows for a, a quote unquote HA experience uh, whereby you store those same secrets in multiple key management providers. And if one fails, it will fall back um, and retrieve values from whichever provider is available. Okay, so we've got our secret management solution sorted. And now we'll talk about our Docker file and of course other things, but that's where Chekhov comes in. Chekhov has support for hundreds of policies that have been developed to do static configuration analysis of static configuration, such as Docker files. These policies are developed by experts and can easily uh, screen for the, the adherence to industry best practices. And Dive can also be used in CI pipelines. People often think of Dive just as a tool for doing deep inspection of all of the different layers in a Docker image, as that is its intended purpose. But it also has the ability to perform analysis against certain metrics like space efficiency. You can fail a CI pipeline, for example, if Dive considers a Docker image to be too bloated and for space inefficient. Um, and on to signed artifacts. Cosign and Notary are two competing solutions in this space, although Co Cosign is, is sort of the, the leading solution at this point. And what it allows you to do is generate a, a cryptographic signature and attach that to an artifact. Signatures can be uploaded to a variety of locations. Today, we'll, in the demo, we'll look at the uh, record transparency log. And then what we can do is we can couple these signed artifacts with solutions, policy as code solutions, such as Caverno or OPA, and enforce policies such as the fact that we would, for instance, only allow, allow running containers that use images that have been signed. We'll see that in the demo. And more security tools. We have uh, the concept of an SBOM, Software Bill of Materials. There's been a lot of hype about this lately, but it's it's really not just hype. What you can do with an SBOM is generate a, a descriptive summarization of all of the dependencies entailed by your code repository. You can generate an SBOM using tools like SIFT, GitBomb, or TURN, and they can target a, a file system or a Docker image or even a binary. And when you get this dependency summary, you can store it in a variety of formats. The full sort of machine friendly format would be the SBOM itself, which can then be piped into a tool like Gripe, Trivi, or, or Claire to do vulnerability scanning. And what that means is essentially looking at the exact components that are mentioned in the, in the bill of materials and their version, and then comparing those against open source um, vulnerability databases like the NIST National Vulnerability Database or the GitHub Advisory Database. And of course, there's you know a mapping there between those dependency versions and known vulnerabilities that you'll want to remediate. And I briefly touched on policy as code already, but popular solutions there, as mentioned, are Kyberno, OPA, Datri, and they do a, a lot of different things, but today we'll be focusing on their ability to restrict containers to, to run exclusively signed images. That's something that we would always recommend in a production environment. All right, that's a, a whirlwind tour of some of the, the tools. Now onto the application itself. My colleague, Nick Vermont designed this somewhat silly, uh, but demonstrative application known as the dad jokes generator. The idea here is as a user, you're thinking to yourself, well, I want a dad joke or many dad jokes because who doesn't want many dad jokes? And you'll send a request to the jokes server. The jokes server will use Nats, which is a, a Golang based message queue uh, that implements the pub sub model to send a message to the quote unquote joke worker. Joke worker, when it receives these requests, will forward them on to OpenAI's API up until a certain point, uh, because what it does is once it receives the response, it will cache that joke in both well, Redis and stored in MongoDB. After a certain number of results have accumulated, it will just return uh, previous results. 
And that's simply to bring in some open source components into this overall architecture which, so that we can then demo how this somewhat complex five-tier app can be deployed using uh, dev space. Okay, on to the details. Here we have the link. The code for this project is all open source. Feel free to check it out and consider playing with this yourself, maybe going through some of the steps that I'll be demoing shortly. Okay spend a little bit of time reviewing the code base, and then we'll jump into some demos. So starting from the top, I'll begin with the makefile. I won't go in, into detail in the targets, but essentially I just wanna mention the makefile because we've developed some simple targets here to build our code and build our images and tear down, you know, set up and tear down. Simple, classic makefile stuff. And what I've already done is I have built some images. So if I do Docker image LS, you can see I've already built the joke worker and the joke server. And these tags uh, were generated by dev space, which we'll see momentarily. Uh, okay. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're using pre-commit to basically lint the content of our git commits. And so in conjunction with pre-commit, we're, we're using git leaks. Git leaks will flag dangerous commits. And because we've installed this uh, pre-commit hook, the, the pre-commit sort of pre executes the git leak check every time we go to make a commit. And I'll be demoing that shortly. And as you can see, configuring that is, is quite simple. We just pop this into a pre-commit config and run a, a command to install the pre-commit hooks and we're ready to go. The command to do that is mentioned in our readme. Actually, the command is not in our readme, but I can update that. It's, it's a simple command. All right, moving on to SOPs. As mentioned, I'll be using SOPs with PGP to encrypt a sensitive manifest such that it can be checked into version control. SOPs config is pretty straightforward, and there are instructions in the readme for how to install and configure SOPs. So at a high level, the repo structure consists of these two uh, services, the joke server and the joke worker. Each service has a Docker file and a main.go. And these uh, agents use a shared library that's inside of internal. Uh, we've got some constants and we've got joke.go. We'll be, we won't be looking at the code in too much depth, but basically you can see here, we want to get a dad joke. So, we might be changing the type of joke later to a Chuck Norris joke, as you as you saw there. So uh, this is just a prompt sent to the OpenAI API. And now I will show you the most interesting part, which is the devspace.yaml file. That's what ties all of this together. So we will be using devspace to not only deploy our app, but also debug our app inside of a local kind cluster. Here at the top, we have some environment variables defined. Our OpenAI API key is being pulled in from the, the environment and our outer environment. And we just have some names for our images and tags. And as I said earlier, the tag is, just, is generated from our, our current Git uh, status as such. Now we have pipelines. We'll just focus on the dev pipeline, but these are essentially just a series of operations that get executed when we invoke the dev space CLI and when we type dev space dev. Essentially what will happen is a number of different things will be installed in our kind cluster and then our development environment that we'll touch on momentarily will, will be initialized. So we'll see more about that here uh, shortly. Here we have image definitions. So we're actually using um, dev space to build these images. And what we have is the name of the image which comes from that variable and then uh, references to the Docker file and the Docker context. And what we can do is when we type dev space dev, if the images aren't already present, dev space will build them uh, for us and then actually load those built images into our kind cluster automatically. Okay, and now, as I mentioned earlier, we have all of these various components we want to deploy. And they're a mixture of, you know, 
Go services that we've developed here in this repo, and then third-party open source um, services such as MongoDB and Redis. And what DevSpace can do is it can deploy uh, in a variety of ways. It can deploy a Helm chart, it can deploy raw manifests, and it can um, use customize as well. So as you can see, Mongo, uh, Redis, and Nats are all just coming in through Helm charts, which is pretty, pretty straightforward. And then our joke server and joke worker both rely on another interesting project from Loft Labs, which is known as Component Chart. So this is a meta Helm chart, which essentially you provide the minimal specification for a deployment, a Kubernetes deployment, and then the Component Chart blows that up into the full uh, manifest that you need to, to, to deploy a deployment or a stateful set, um, or I believe a raw pod, as well as a service to expose that workload. So essentially, it's just a um, very concise way to generate Kubernetes manifests. And we have the joke server and the joke worker. Both of them are connecting through to NATs with this connection string. And then the joke worker is, of course, also connecting to Redis and Mongo. And the joke worker also needs to be able to interact with OpenA APIs, OpenAI's API. And it does so using this secret and we'll, we'll see shortly how we're generating the secret from our encrypted manifest using SOPs. Lastly, we're also deploying some custom resources into our cluster and those we can see here under custom resources. And that's basically just our Redis and MongoDB instances. So we deploy the operators through the Helm charts, but then those operators need to reconcile that custom resource that we create uh, down here to actually uh, deploy those, those two services. And lastly, we have the dev section, well, dev and hooks. So when we run dev space dev, everything I've mentioned above will happen. A variety of things will be deployed into our environment. And then here, what we're saying is automatically configure a port forward against this joke server container. And that will allow us to curl it uh, using a localhost URL. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Then what we have here for the joke worker is somewhat more complex we're using the dev space restart helper here to automatically recompile our code when certain files change. So if the content of any of these files here uh, changes, then the restart helper will automatically recompile our code and we will have our changes ready to go just like that. Okay. And we have hooks and commands. These hooks are, are basically just for cleanup, at least th these ones. So when we run dev space purge at the end of the demo, you'll see that we can tear everything down, which we initially spun up using dev space dev. And then these, these hooks are just custom actions that we take in order to fully clean up, uh, for instance, the custom resources um, like Redis, and we'll delete our secret that we create from the OpenAI API key and a PPC. And then up here, we have another hook, which is invoking SOPs. So before we apply all of those um, other deployments, we need to ensure we have a secret in the cluster that the joke worker can rely on. And what we're doing here is we're just invoking SOPs to decrypt this manifest. This, this is the encrypted manifest that has our, our secret in it and then apply it. But how do we generate that encrypted manifest? That's what we do here with a dev space command. This command is really just like uh, uh, analogous to a make target. Could have been done with make, but I wanted to demo the power of dev space here. So it's just a bash command. We're going to create a secret from our environment. We'll pipe that out to a file, and then we'll run SOPs to encrypt that file and save it uh, here as this file name, which you can see matches the one here that we subsequently decrypt and, and apply. And then, of course, we we catted, we echoed out that um, unsafe, unencrypted secret to this file. So we'll just clean up the file at the end. All right, so that's a, a deep dive into the dev space config and what it'll do for us. Now let's actually jump into some demos. You can see here in this shell, I have K9S up and running. And this is my local kind cluster. It's pretty much a vanilla environment. I've installed Kyverno, as you can see here. Otherwise, we have a, a pretty clean uh, kind cluster. 
Now in this shell here, what I will do is I will run dev space dev. And that was the wrong session. Sorry about that. I will run dev space dev. And before I run dev space dev, what I need to do is actually generate that encrypted file, which I had deleted. Uh, as you can see here, this file is not being found because I missed a step. So what I will do is I will execute dev space run and the name of that, that command. And what you can see here is that this encrypted manifest was generated. This contains our encrypted OpenAI API key. And we did that using SOPs with PGP encryption. So we've set up our environment. Now we will do dev space dev. And you can see here that hook I was mentioning executed smoothly now that the manifest is there to decrypt. And we've applied a couple of Helm charts against our kind cluster and you can see here, things are starting to come up. Of course, we have some errors, which is expected because that's the beauty of Kubernetes. It will automatically reconcile until this is resolved. Basically, the joke server uh, tried to start before Mongo, Nats, and Redis were all healthy. But as you can see, they're all up and running now. So we have our whole architecture up, and that was just uh, you know one, one simple command, dev space dev and it deployed everything that we saw in that diagram, including our custom services. And it also did some of the other things I mentioned, which are setting up a port forward automatically. So as you can see here, the joke server uh, pod is being forwarded to local port 8080. And this bi-directional file sync has synchronized the files in our local IDE directly into the joke worker container. And that's pretty cool because what we can do next is we can make edits to our local code and see those changes happen instantly in this container. Not only that, but because those changes were detected by DevSpace, the restart helper will auto recompile our code and the changes will be live basically as soon as we press save. So uh, before we make any changes though, let's just generate a few jokes so that we can see that this is working. who doesn't want dad jokes? Okay, yeah. The buy son one is, is, is a favorite. Pretty cheesy. Okay, moving on. So we've got some dad jokes in our database, but what if we, instead of dad jokes, wanted to generate Chuck Norris jokes? So what I would do is just go to my source code as I'm doing my, my development and change dad to Chuck Norris. But I'm not gonna save it because what I wanna do first is show you what's going on in that container. And so if I shell into the joke worker and just show the file system, we can cat internal joke, joke.go, grab or tell. You can see here, uh, we have tell me a dad joke. And then if I show you the running processes, we have the joke worker process running as PID 277. And you can see this restart helper is actually running as PID 1. And if I exit out of here and show you the logs, we had previously saved the file. So you see this restart container message, but what I will do is I'll make the, another change and you'll see this, this come up again. So when I save this file, because now we want Chuck Norris jokes, right there, uh, killed, the restart container was invoked. So that's the dev space restart helper. Now I will shell back in. First, we'll look at the processes. So the restart helper is still PID1, of course, but joke worker is no longer 277. As you can see, it's been auto recompiled and is now running as PID 452. And additionally, we can cat internal joke, joke.go, grep for tell. 
And just like that, our source code now says Chuck Norris. Pretty cool. So to just come full circle on that, what I will do is generate five more jokes for you, which will perhaps be funnier. <laughs> That's a new one. Haven't seen that one before. Good stuff. All right. So uh, that is a whirlwind tour of DevSpace and the, the power of its bi-directional file sync and its flexible uh, configuration for deploying to uh, Kubernetes environment. So next, what we will do is we will focus on security. So as I showed you earlier, we have those images. Um, I will just pull them up again for your reference. As you can see, we have an unsigned image, and then we have these other images that, that were built uh, using DevSpace. What we're going to do is we're going to generate an SBOM for one of these images. And to do that, I will use SIFT. So first I will output in JSON format and we'll just take a look at what that looks like. It's a machine friendly format, but it contains the most verbose information and that's what we will need in order to generate our vulnerabilities with Gripe. Sift and Gripe are complementary tools from Antore. They're super easy to use. They have GitHub Actions that you can implement with just a couple clicks to automatically generate and uh, run uh, checks against for all of your GitHub repos. So I recommend checking out Sift and Gripe. All right, so we can see this command joke server sbomb.json file was updated. And as mentioned, it's, it's machine readable, not really human readable. So we're not gonna dig too much into all of this metadata. But instead, we will rerun that command using the table format. This time we'll see a much prettier representation of all the dependencies that SIFT was able to detect from our, our Docker image. And here we go. So pretty simple, dependency name, version type. So we've got some Debian packages some Go modules, uh, et cetera, and then what we want to do is understand the vulnerabilities that are implied by those various dependencies. So we can use write, and we'll actually just point right at that SBOM that we generated. You can also point write at an image and it will invoke SIFT and generate the SBOM as a convenience, but this is a little bit faster. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, Gripe is comparing those dependencies and their versions against uh, open databases like NIST's database to uh, associate those dependencies and versions against known vulnerabilities. We'll see a summary here shortly, and it's pretty bad. So that's actually by design, and I'll jump over to the Docker file to explain why. But as you can see, we have these dependencies, their version, and uh, vulnerability code, which you can look up uh, online, and the severity. So this is pretty rough. Hopefully your images, at least not the ones you're using in production, would look anything like that. And the reason why is what we didn't do is use multi-stage builds, which you should be doing in production. So you can see here, this Docker file just uses a Golang-based image, uh, copies in go.mod and the code, excuse me, compiles that code, and we're done. But what we should be doing is having a final build stage here in our Docker file where we start uh, from scratch using an, a very lightweight secure image like Google's distroless image. And then we copy our compiled binary into that image, thus reducing our dependency footprint dramatically. If we had have done that, the SIFT and gripe demo wouldn't have been as interesting, but it would have been much more secure. So that's, that's SIFT and gripe. And what we wanna do next is sign our worker image and then demonstrate how we can enforce that that image is used uh, or that the, any containers in our cluster are using signed images. 
To do that, I will use cosine and I will just enter the name of the image that I want to use. So we have to accept this disclaimer here for SIGSTOR, which I will do. And then we're gonna use Google OIDC. And we have successfully authenticated. What that means is that a signature was generated and it was uploaded to the record transparency log. And now other tools can check that transparency log to validate that our artifacts are indeed signed. So I will show you what that looks like on the command line with cosine. Uh, we can do cosine verify, plug in our image, and then we just have to provide some flags for authentication. So uh, OIDC here, we're gonna use my email address. We'll pipe the output to JQ just so it's a little bit prettier. And there we go. I won't unpack this because it's not that interesting, but as you can see, it succeeded and we have verified that this image is indeed signed. So we know the cosine piece worked. Now, how do we enforce that we use signed images in our cluster? As I mentioned earlier, I installed Kyverno using Helm and we have this admission controller here, which will reconcile uh, various custom resources, one of which is the uh, cluster policy resource. So here in our repo, we have a YAML file, a manifest, uh, which defines a cluster policy. Essentially what it says is for any pod or deployment resources, check the images used by all of the containers in the, the pods and if they are coming from the Tyler Gilson repo, then we will use this attester, which is the Google OIDC attester, to check the record transparency log and verify that the image in question has a signature. So what we need to do is apply that cluster policy to our cluster. Okay, there, it was applied. And now we can, in KNNS, take a look quickly at the cluster policies. And we see here it's being enforced and we have our same YAML. Cool. So assuming everything is correct, what will happen now is if we attempt to create a pod that uses an unsigned image, it will be blocked. And I will do that by performing K. K is just an alias for kubectl, so kubectl run, and we're going to run this unsigned image. And perfect, as we expected, the Caverno admission controller blocked our request because it was unable to look up a signature for that image. Now, just to prove to you that it really does work for a signed image, I will do the same thing. And in this case, I'll pass in the image uh, with the tag that we just signed. Perfect, the pod was created. It's actually gonna crash because it doesn't have the right environment config uh, specified, but that's not the point. Um, it is, it did uh, get applied to the API server, which is, which is what we wanted. So I'll just delete that. And all right, so we've been doing some, some development and let's just look at our Git status. So we have some, some files uh, that have changed. And now let's simulate what happens if we have an unsafe commit. So I'm actually going to uh, cat, or I'm going to echo my API key to a file. And I'm not gonna show you that file because that would be unsafe. But what I will do is I will add foo.txt, and then I will perform a git commit. And it's blocked. So that's what I was mentioning earlier about git leaks and uh, pre-commit. So I have my pre-commit hooks installed, which execute git leaks every time I run a commit. And as you can see, they detected sensitive data in that in the diff for that commit, and they blocked blocked my commit. So I will just do a git restore and remove that file. And that was good. We didn't we didn't commit the the sensitive data. So. We have finished our demos. Now I will just tear down the environment. So we have this process here where we have dev space running. 
and I will just exit out and run dev space purge. And before I do that, I just have to delete the cluster policy. Now we can see here the dad jokes namespace has our all of our services. And when we run dev space purge, it's going to bring everything down. Um, just like that. Everything that we deployed in our local kind cluster is cleaned up and we're back to this uh, pristine state. So that is dev space. It's super powerful. Uh, barely scratched the surface of what it can do. I encourage you to, to check it out and see about integrating some of these tools I've demoed in, in your workflow. We'll jump back to the slides for a brief moment for a final recap. Okay, some key takeaways. Developing cloud native apps is easier than ever, but in order to do it, you need to understand the ecosystem and the ever expanding array of tools at your disposal. And using those tools ties into developer experience, which is fundamental for Kubernetes adoption. However, there are a lot of them and it can be overwhelming. Things can feel complex. So I encourage you to start small and focus on what makes your life easier today. And not only easier, but more secure because security is extremely important uh, as always. And we need to be considering security at every stage of the development life cycle, which ties into the whole uh, shift left mentality and bringing the inner loop closer in line with the outer loop without making our lives unbearable as developers. And we should focus on making not only our developer environment, but really everything about our software, uh, portable, shippable, and sharing, shareable, uh, because sharing is caring, just like those kittens think. Okay. One, one last thing before I let you go. Is there a simpler way? Yes, we have SpectroCloud Palette, Palette Developer Engine. And this is just a screenshot from for the same five tier app taken from what we call PDE. And as you can see, we have all the same layers, but they're configured using this nice user interface and they leverage a powerful abstraction that we refer to as an application profile. So this profile defines everything that we were showing in the demo through, through dev space, all the same environment config, uh, the ordering of the tiers, the, the images, et cetera. But that application profile can be deployed into a number of different environments. So each environment might be a, a different Kubernetes cluster or a virtual cluster inside of a, a physical IaaS cluster. And then um, not only that, but if you make an edit to the application profile, which is the central source of truth, that uh, update, the edit that you introduced can be applied to all of the different uh, physical sort of instantiations of your app. So it allows you to model your applications and treat that config as a single source of truth. Uh, we have a free trial. I encourage you to check it out. You can click the link here and see for yourself. Uh, lastly, we covered a bunch of tools today. Git, make, sops, dev space, pre-commit, and K9S. K9S was sort of demoed implicitly, but I did mention it. That's uh, be careful if you use it too much, you'll forget how to use kubectl, but I find that it is a fantastic tool to speed up and enhance your ability to interact with Kubernetes. And that's it. Lastly, again, uh, my name's Tyler. Thanks for watching. Feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or Twitter. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for your time.